I'm Dr. Mel and welcome to another episode of Dr. Mel's Message. Today's interview is very exciting to me. Number one, it has to do with space. And number two, it has to do with under the water. And I cannot begin to tell you how both fascinate me. So I cannot wait for you to be introduced to Glenn Butler, who is the author of Bending Atmospheres. So without further ado, welcome. Glenn, how are you today? Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I, I tell you what, I'm really excited. Just from the onset of the cover of your book, it had me hooked. So tell everybody first, what, what is Bending Atmospheres about? Bending Atmospheres is about an adventure, my adventure, uh, growing up as a, a child into an adult and my fascination with first underwater and then outer space and my opportunity to meet people along the way who helped me. It's really the whole story is about mentorship and about people that, that help you find your goals and, and meet your dreams. And uh, I've been very fortunate in my life to meet a, a, a number of wonderful people and who have well, I think all of us stand on the shoulders of the people before us. And uh, it was an acknowledgement to those people. And uh, it's hard to write a first person story about other people, but I think I've done it. All right. Now, first of all, when you're saying bending atmospheres, number one, you're talking about mentorship, et cetera. So tell us a little bit about your life and your experiences with underwater. And number two, have you ever been to outer space? No, I haven't. I've trained astronauts, though, so that's as close as I've gotten. And uh, so, you know, as a child, uh, my dad took me, my dad was a military diver, and we lived in Florida, and he took me diving when I was seven years old. And from that, from that moment on, uh, I always knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a diver, and I wanted to explore the, the underwater world. And from that, and from my understanding and developing technologies of, of pressure and of water and gas mixtures and things like that, it was a natural segue for me to get involved with, with, um, with space flight and with astronauts. It's all about pressure, you know, and, and uh, so it's about human physiology under pressure, whether it be water hydraulic pressure or the vacuum of space and maintaining your atmosphere within your spacesuit. Is there really any difference between under underwater pressure and pressure in outer space for astronauts? Yes, there is. The, the, uh, if we go from the sea level to outer space, the change in pressure is only one atmosphere as 14.7 pounds per square inch, the thickness of the atmosphere. And, and uh, uh, however, because of the difference in density, one atmosphere that 14.7 pounds is equivalent to 33 feet of seawater. So if we go down to let's say a thousand feet, which I have been to, a thousand feet underwater is 445 pounds per square inch. And so it's many, many times more physiologically challenging than, than, uh, uh, than, than, uh, than what you would experience in space. They do it at 18,000 miles an hour. That's the difference. And we might go along swimming underwater at one or two miles an hour. Now, you said that you have been involved in training astronauts. In what capacity? Yes, yeah, so the, the, uh, uh, all, the, all the space um, walks that are done, the EVAs the, the, uh, the, in, in spacesuits, are done, are simulated underwater first in order to permit you to try and simulate zero gravity as, as best as possible. So uh, using, using of large tanks, neutral buoyancy lab in Houston being at the Johnson Space Center being one example, uh, there's an entire space station underwater and astronauts are able to, to simulate all the things that we'll do in space many times over, examine the most efficient ways to do it, be sure they have all the right tools and so forth. So they can complete the actual act um, without any without any problems. That that's just fascinating. Now, what do you hope people really get out of your book, Bending Atmospheres? 
uh, about, about a, an understanding of the relationships in pressure and the relationships with people. Uh, and that, that um, uh, I've been very fortunate to meet some very special people along the way that have really uh, taken my career to, to places I never thought it would. I've, I've gone from underwater to get involved with out of space to jumping over into medicine and using pressure in medicine. And uh, so I've been very fortunate along the way, but it's all there. Everything is, is a relationship of pressure. And uh, our whole existence is really about, um, uh, about creating environments um, that where the humans can exist, whether it be underwater or outer space or in toxic atmospheres or um, you know, on Mars. Have you been involved in any of the things like with Arminus that's going to, to the moon or even the first flight? supposedly going to Mars? Have I'm, you I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I vicariously watch all this. My son and his wife, she's in charge of the Artemis uh, program and, and the, the Orion spacecraft. Um, but so I, my son, I was a single parent for a long time. And I used to take my son with me down to Houston and other places like that and discuss how we were going to make repairs um, on the Hubble Space Telescope. So I first got involved with um, NASA with the Hubble Space Telescope repair in 91, in that uh, when it was launched, it had a defect in the mirror. It would now need a set of eyeglasses put on, special lenses, and that would require many days of full eight hour days of changing out all the uh, optical and other equipment and replacing it with equipment that was correct. Now, and just that, recently, the Hubble spacecraft was down, but it's now back up. Yes, yes, it was down for about a month. It had a software problem. And if you think about it, it's been, it's really been a miracle of American technology. It's lasted, you know, 30 years now. And, and it's just, it, the, the images, it changed our whole world in terms of what we've been able to visualize that was not possible before. So it's really a, an amazing device. So when, when it was launched and had this problem, it was a, a tremendous blow for NASA. They had to fix this right away. So at that time, the longest spacewalk had been two hours. So uh, now they were facing three astronauts working six to eight hours a day times several days to accomplish all this work. It all had to be done underwater to simulate it to make sure they didn't make any mistakes. And they, they saw all the, the problems they might develop in space. So um, they, they could not breathe compressed air underwater to simulate this. So they involved myself and Dr. Hamilton, Bill Hamilton. We were experts in something called nitrox, which is enriched air oxygen, where we take oxygen, we take air and mix it with oxygen to make higher percentages of oxygen, therefore to reduce the decompression um, limits. So instead of 21% oxygen air that we're breathing right now, we would breathe 46% oxygen, which is the maximum safe amount, but that also decreased the amount of inert gas, the, the nitrogen that we had, which permitted us to stay longer underwater. So they could stay the whole eight hours underwater and not have to decompress. And that was very important for the simulation. I guess so, because even when somebody, let's say scuba dives, you have to worry about the decompression coming up too fast and getting the bends. Of course, and and sport divers use nitrox as well. There's there's a the NOAA has a table for 32 and 36 percent oxygen, which permits slightly longer decompression times, and it's been a sport diving technology. But we were using it commercially before that in higher levels, and, and so we we transferred that technology over to NASA, and uh, so that's how I got started working with NASA and, and training astronauts. Wow. That, that's one incredible story. Now, who are some of your mentors? Um, beginning back with my, my certainly my father and, and, and even more him, before him, my grandparents and my father and mother were certainly the, the mentors as they should be. And, and, uh, but beyond their normal parenting, they, they had a great deal to do in terms of mentorship, in terms of development. And I guess all parents, if you're, if you're doing your job, you, you do a good job at that. Um, the, the other people I met, my father just realized he, needed, he was trying to help me find my career 
I, I decided I want to be a diver and, and, and going to, to and be not just a diver, be under involved in water exploration. And um, uh, I, college was, was too slow for me. And I looked at the military and decided that wasn't for me either. <clears throat> it also was, was, wasn't latest technology. And so right in Terrytown, New York, there happened to be Union Carbide um, corporate research there. And they had a company called Ocean Systems, which was involved in a lot of military contract work. And um, so I went to work there as, as 17 years old. I, I went up and met Dr. Hamilton, Dr. Bill Hamilton. He became my, my greatest mentor. And uh, he gave me, gave me a job. It was sweeping the floors and taking care of our experimental pigs for a while. But we, um, uh, we would, the laboratory was involved in doing both deep diving and outer space simulations uh, and looking at the physiology of that. And I basically started work as a guinea pig. Wow. Now, bending atmospheres, who is your target audience for this book? It's primarily people with sport diving backgrounds, but really anybody that's interested in underwater, out of space will, will I think, enjoy it because it talks a lot about everything is, are, is a relative connection to the other. And, uh, and, and so the pressure certainly is and the physiology certainly is. And whether it be an outer space or underwater uh, is, is the, the physiological or the physical aspects of it, the science is pretty interesting. And... I've tried to, to, to relate that in the book in a way that's it's understandable for anybody. And it's also enjoyable for anybody. I've had people from the most experienced PhD scientists and physicians say, wow, this is great, Glenn, down to someone who just started scuba diving and said, you know, I understood the whole thing. And so that's important. That's a, that's a hard balance to keep. Now, you had a writing partner with this book, right? Yes, yes. Tell me a little bit about him or Brad her. King, yeah, Brad, Brad King is a uh, is a uh, W. B. King is a, is a uh, he's a writer and he's done ghost writing and all sorts of things like that. I needed I needed someone to help me <clears throat> write this write this book and and do it in a in a in a timely way. I had all the information. I knew what I wanted to say, but I needed help with organization. Uh, grammatics, the you know all those all those things, the organization part of it, and um, he's been very helpful. He's become a good friend, and we we uh, we're writing another book together, and and uh, I look forward to continuing to write a number of books with them. And when is your next book? What is it called, and when will it be available? It's a CMAC, it's called CMAC One, which is about a, a runaway oil rig in the North Sea. And it's all based upon real, these are things that really happened. Some of them happened to me or that I was aware of. And I started writing this book several years ago. And then I stopped when Bill Hamilton died, I stopped. I said, I really need to go back and write the story about the people I met at Union Carbide and in Tarrytown before that story is lost because it would have been lost forever. So I went and stopped and wrote Bending Atmospheres just to really as a salute to all those people around me that helped me stand on their shoulders, you know. And uh, so now we're back to back to uh, CMAC one, and it's it'll be I think, hopefully out in September. And um, it's uh, it's it's a real action adventure, and I hope it'll make a great movie. And I know it'll make a great movie. I hope it gets picked up as one. But it's a real good action adventure, all based upon real things, and it's um, and it's it's um, it it has a I don't even know what you would call it. I have I have a an alter ego is there uh, goes back to Clive Cussler's series of books. He had um, a, a person in there called Dirk Pitt, and that was really his alter ego, and he used that name, that pen name. Uh, to represent him, and I do the same thing in in uh, in in CMAC one. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about your cover. It's very interesting. How did you come up with that concept? Well, astronauts actually fly around the Earth um, in, in orbit around the Earth upside down, and and uh, they're looking. So the the space shuttle was operating upside down. And uh, so, does, so does the space station. People don't realize that, but it's actually facing 
it's looking down on the earth is the interesting part. So it's looking down. And uh, so I wanted to, to draw the relationship between the very thin atmosphere of only 50 miles, you know, which, which uh, we've just seen with, with Bezos and, and uh, uh, only 50 miles of atmosphere. And that being space with astronauts working up in space and then below the, below the water, below the atmosphere and then below the water, people working underwater. So that, that, those, that paradox, I thought putting it, those two things in the, in the, the, the cover of the book would help explain the, the, what it was all about. That, that makes total sense to me now that I'm looking at it. The, uh, the premise of the, the whole book is fascinating. Number one, just to, for clarification purposes, it is a memoir, right? Yes, it is. It is. It's all. It's all true, and it's all me. <laughs> it's all about who you are, where you've been, and how um, you delve into, I guess, your mentorships. Do you advise everyone to have a mentor? Oh yes, I think that mentorship, and it's important to be a mentor. To other people, I think you're you you become uh, becoming a mentor is critical, and people that do it at all different levels without realizing it. Whether you're a baseball coach or um, you you you're a Boy Scout leader or any of those things, uh, you you are a mentor. A teacher should be mentors. Um, <clears throat> all of us have the ability to take someone and be helpful to someone, especially children. And I'm, I'm a big brother. And, and so anytime you can help a person that needs some leadership, some example of leadership and, and uh, um, adult, adult uh, you know, leadership is, is important. So do you think in our lifetime we'll ever see the colonization of Mars? Yes, I do. I, I think that, that um, I think we will. And, and it's, uh, I think it'll, it'll, of course, start with the moon. And, uh, but I think eventually it will, it will, uh, it will go, go to Mars and, and, and probably beyond. Wow. Um, I'm sure you probably get asked this question a lot uh, about your beliefs, maybe that there are other life forms in our universe besides humans. Yes, I think that it, it's probably it's statistically impossible if you look at some of the Hubble Space Telescope things. And I want to tell anybody, if you have a chance to go to NASA.gov and look at some of the high resolution photographs taken by the Hubble and realize that the, there's, there's billions of galaxies. Uh, and and uh, it's, they, some people have said that there are as many galaxies as there are grains of sand on all the beaches of the Earth. Wow. Well, if we think about that and you think about we're in the Milky Way and we're just an ordinary little planet uh, in, a, in an ordinary solar system of one of one of several billion in the Milky Way, I think it's pretty impossible that there wouldn't be, you know, other life forms. And because life, life thrives almost everywhere. Give it a chance, it goes. And it actually it adapts. Um, Yes. I remember, I don't know if you remember this or not, but back in 2010, a uh, astrophysicist, I guess, by the name of Dr. Felicia Simon Wolf, found a microbe in the bottom of Mono Lake that she claimed thrived off of arsenic instead of phosphorus. Are you familiar with any of this? Yes, I've heard that. I didn't know the name of the particulars, but I'd heard that before. Yes, yes. And I was just, I was just curious, you know, has there been other findings like this, to your knowledge? I, I not, not an extraterrestrial that I'm aware of. There's been what they think are, are some, some, um, some fossils that were collected, and I think it's still up in the air as to whether or not there, there, there were, there were actually fossils or not of microbes, but. If you look at some of the deep, deep underwater exploration, mm -hmm. um, the, like what they call the black smokers, which are, are fissures of, of um, hot water coming up through, um, th through the bedrock. And there's six or 700 degrees because of the pressure, the water doesn't boil. 
But in fact, all around that are living organisms, the tube worms and, and fish with no eyes and shrimp and that are all living there. And there is no photosynthesis there. There is no light. And they're living off, they're living off um, other chemicals uh, in order to carry on the, the, the replacement for photosynthesis. It's just fascinating. Yeah, that, that is quite fascinating. I mean, it, it has nothing to do with your book, but why I had such a, a intelligent person that is in this area, you know, I, I had to ask the question for, oh, of for my viewership. Yeah. I had to ask. Yes, and, you know, there, there are people that, that look at, at, uh, at, at uh, what happened to, at, at, at one time in the history of our, our solar system, you know, the, the earth was still too hot and primitive, but Mars was right in the sweet spot and Mars had water at one time. And Mars had rushing water and, and had, had um, the remnants of, of all the erosion and so forth that like the Grand Canyon and so forth. So it had, it had a tremendous amount of water. And I think it's still up in the air yet as to whether or not perhaps, imagine if there had been a civilization there that is long, long since gone, Mars lost its atmosphere because it lost its magnetic pole and therefore lost its ability to protect itself from the solar wind. And when that happened, the, the, now the solar wind and the radiation and so forth could, could impact the planet directly and it lost all its atmosphere, lost its water. So and, what you're saying then, it is highly possible that at one time Mars could have sustained a certain amount of life. Yeah, well, it certainly, it certainly had water and it certainly had a lot of things and there's, there's methane and all kinds of things being discovered up there. Even some liquid water still exists. And I think that it's, uh, I think we're going to, the, the fact that we can put uh, robots up there and look around and everything, I think there's some major discoveries still, uh, still in the making. And it's, uh, it's a fascinating time to be alive in terms of the ability to, to go and, you know, machinery has gotten so good, you almost don't have to go there <laughs> to see what's going on, you know? <laughs> well, you know, when I think of space travel, et cetera, you know, there, there's a lot out there, like you said, with the Jeff Bezos of the worlds that are doing it independently, et cetera. Do you see that as really a viable alternative to travel one day? Uh, the space, the space travel? Yeah. Oh, well, I think that in getting around the earth, it, it, we're not gonna be able to do much better than we do right now. There are, there are, there will be improvements in the aircraft that we use that the, the sort of skip along the atmosphere. So it's like three hours to get to Japan as an example. Mm -hmm. I think that technology will happen. Um, and then getting other places, I think there's, there's no more efficient way probably than, than these what they call skippers that, that will go up into the, way up into the upper atmosphere and almost operate like spaceships, but sitting up at the top of the atmosphere and sort of skipping like a stone across Probably. the top of the atmosphere and then coming back down like an airplane. Wow. For those of you that may have just either joined us and don't know what we're talking about, I am speaking with Glenn Butler, who is one of the co-authors of the book, Bending Atmospheres, A Journey from Inner to Outer Space. And he works in this field, and but the book isn't necessarily about space travel or scuba diving. It's actually about mentorship and the pressures that are around us. And it's a fascinating, fascinating read. And number one, you know, Glenn, I want to thank you for coming on to Dr. Mel's message. I think we could talk for hours about the this subject, but unfortunately, we can't. And so, with one last question. What's next for you? I, I'm, uh, I really enjoy what I'm doing now. I work in hyperbaric medicine and we're doing research on COVID and uh, we're working with veterans to help them with post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, using again, oxygen under pressure. And I found that it, it's just another extension of what I've been doing all my life. You know, it's uh, I'm having a lot of fun doing it and, and I like being able to make real contributions, you know, and, and uh, you look at these poor veterans and the stresses that they're having. And so that's, that's become my most important 
thing to do right now and then and then write books to help keep me sane. <laughs> that, that is a beautiful thought. And again, I wanna thank you. And I also wanna thank Strat Advertising for bringing you to Dr. Mel's message. She, uh, that company is fabulous when it comes to working with authors. And you have just been an absolute delight. And if you ever wanna come back on to this, especially when your next book comes out in September, get a whole Strat Advertising. I'd love to have you back on. We'll, we'll be back with you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Glenn, and I wish you the best of luck in your journey, whether it's outer space or underwater. Same to you and your blog. Take care, dear. Bye-bye.